you're still here. <laughs> Why? <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, it's, it's, you know, I've been looking forward to this day for 52 years. Been a while. I've been working on this VR stuff, AR stuff, you name it, for all this time. And now, finally, it's, some good is coming out of it, right? How gratifying is that? My talk is about lifting humanity. Okay, okay. how did that happen? Somebody, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Walt. Uh, so, thank you for lifting. You are the lifters. And I'm so grateful that, uh, that you've come, that I've been able to come. This is my very first uh, uh, Games for Change meeting. Mind you, I've had moles in this organization for a while, but it's good now to be here myself and get to press the flesh and feel the spirit that's here, which is really amazing. So, you are the lifters. Now, I didn't start my career being a lifter. I was actually sort of a warrior. Here I graduated from Duke University in electrical engineering in 1966 and uh, commissioned at the same time as an officer in the Air Force. I was gonna go to the war. And uh, as it turns out, they didn't ship me to Vietnam. What they did was they shipped me to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base where they put me to work on developing systems, especially cockpits. I was supposed to work on advanced cockpits for fighter airplanes. So I was sort of a contemporary at the time with two other individuals who were there. One was Mort Heilig. Mort was trying to develop new ways for people to experience film beyond just the visual and acoustic. He wanted to provide tactile and smell and all these kinds of things. So he was actually a filmmaker on steroids, sort of pushing this envelope, and he created what was called a sensorama, which was this arcade game. Now, at the same time, you've probably heard of Ivan Sutherland. Ivan Sutherland, a real pioneer in computer graphics and computer interfaces, was trying to figure out a better way to interface with computers rather than looking at a flat screen. And he came up with this sketch pad notion, or sort of Damocles, where you could actually interact with a computer in a three-dimensional world by using the ability to move around and point at things and so forth. And then there's this, this brand new second lieutenant <laughs> who shows up on the scene and I know nothing, but I have a problem to solve. So my job was to figure out how we couple one human to this enormous machine, a complex machine that flies very fast, delivers energy from one place to another, has 50 computers on board, and 300 switches, 75 displays, 11 switches on the control stick, and nine switches on the throttle. You're flying past the speed of sound, maybe twice the speed of sound, trying to keep track of the good guys and the bad guys, pulling G's to the boundaries of consciousness and being shot at at the same time. Sort of a busy day at the office, you know. So that was my job. And as it turns out, there's a lot of problems that were there, even at that time. And you see some of these problems here. We had this situation of where we're aiming the whole airplane, the aim the systems on the airplane. And how would we see at night? because we had to do that. We had to see the bad guys at night, flying at low altitude, high speeds, and so forth. And we had to have other ways of representing information. And the way we were doing it is by having these instruments in the cockpit. And it was overwhelming. The manual for the, the Dash 1 manual for the F-16 radars, that thick, 60 modes you can call up, and that's just the radar by itself. So it was clear to me that we needed to have a paradigm shift. We couldn't keep doing things the way we were because there just wasn't flat enough space in the cockpit to do that. And that's the most expensive real estate on the earth is every square inch in a cockpit. If you want to build something or change something in there, it costs a fortune. So what I started investigating is this whole idea of virtuality. Because the cool thing about virtual images is they appear to be located in some place in space, but they aren't really there. If there's a way that we could actually do that, project that, so that we can make up for that lost space or that lack of space that we have in the cockpit. So I started to work on those things, and here you see Lieutenant Furness up here wearing the world's first, the first Air Force head-mounted display in 1967. And what it did was give you a 30-degree field of view, virtual image, using a miniature cathode ray tube. It was mounted on the side of the helmet with 15 kilovolts of uh, charge on that to make it work. 
And of course, uh, we magnified and collimated and projected it so you saw this image. And if you want to see the outside world, you just use your other eye, right? We didn't really understand how Mother Nature worked at that point in time. But nevertheless, that was the way we did display. But then we need to have a way to aim things. So this is our tracking system. My helmet tracking system came a little bit later in 69 that gave us the ability to measure where the head is pointed in the cockpit. And then we decided what we could do is actually put these two together. We could actually now, while we're displaying an image, we could uh, track where the helmet is located. So that way we knew where the image was in three-dimensional space the whole time. And we could also stabilize information in that image. Depending on where you wanted to look around, it could stay in one place in space. So it's like a head-up display that would surround you. This visor, by the way, this, this particular helmet, is a parabolic visor display where we project uh, bouncing off of this visor several times. And what you see is this virtual image at optical infinity, but you don't even see any other equipment in the way. And we can con control the transmission of that visor. So if you don't want to see through it, it becomes a virtual display. If you want to see through it, it becomes an augmented reality display. We never did distinguish between these things. It was all one continuum to us. So further on, we decided, well, how are we going to now deal with this complexity in the cockpit? It was clear that we weren't going to get there the way we were doing now with all these computers on board and with these discrete instruments, even though we could move our head around and hook it to sensors as you could see at night, forward looking at infrared, low light level television. So wherever you move your head, the sensor goes in that same direction and you look through the cockpit and you can see at night flying around. But that wasn't good enough. We had to figure out a way to get bandwidth to and from the, the brain of this co cockpit and this, this pilot in the cockpit. So what we did was start working on this notion of a virtual cockpit where the whole cockpit would be represented as something that you wear. And uh, to do this, we built a simulator. This is my Darth Vader simulator, built in 1981, as you see here. We made it operate, started working on it in 1977. And you lower this huge helmet on your head. This is now a simulator, remember? You lower this helmet on your head, and it has a negator spring assembly that helps support the weight so it doesn't make your head and your neck break. And uh, we had two. Um, special optical systems and a, 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 some new cathode ray tubes that were driven by new display electronics that were water cooled. These things ran so hot and so fast we had to cool them with water. This is a simulator. And this is all attached to uh, uh, eight VAX computers that would do the plant dynamics, the aircraft and enemy dynamics, all this kind of thing. We had two Evans Sullivan picture systems, one to draw the left eye and one to draw the right eye. So whenever we turned on this, we had to call Dayton Power and Light Company and tell them to put on a new turbine in order to make this thing work. So what you had now is a 120 degree field of view by 80 degree field of view, stereographic, with track with 16 bit electromagnetic tracking. We had speech input, eye tracking, hand tracking, uh, and those kinds of things. And so what we did is started doing experiments to find out how this worked. Brought in fighter pilots from Edwards Air Force Base to test this. They took one look at my Darth Vader helmet and they said, Furness, you gotta be kidding me. We said, now wait guys, you have to understand that uh, this is just a simulator and this is what the airborne system is gonna look like. We'd hired Lucasfilms to come up with 100 different designs of helmet sorts. This is after they did Star Wars. They could do cool stuff and we had this sexiest looking helmet you've ever seen. It had lightning bolts painted on the side of it and yeah, pilots have to look good. I mean, they have to have this confidence, you know, to strut their stuff. So they look at that, and we use boron composite materials. It was lighter weight than the regular Air Force helmet and all the stuff in it. Um, mind you, it cost a lot, but nevertheless, that was the idea. And so they would fly this mission, and they were able to do things they've never been able to do before because they could see things projected into space, wide field of view. And this image would open up to them. And the, the first word that coming out of our mouth is, wow. And then after they finished, they said, when can we have it? I've been able to do things I've never been able to do before. And it wasn't because of the, 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 uh, the sensors and the other technologies, weapons systems in the aircraft was different. It's just that we were representing it a different way to that pilot. So that led to the super cockpit program where we are now developing holographic optics and laser projections and things like that. And so that we could eventually convert this cockpit that I mentioned to you before, this happens to be a, an a F-18 cockpit, 
to something that looks like this. So what this is is a mimetic display. It draws this big picture for the pilot. This is what you see flying at, at night uh, and low altitude and high speed with all this fusion of information of where the good guys are, the bad guys are, what the weapon states are, uh, where friendlies are in the sky, where enemies are the sky, uh, the, uh, the, um, our fuel flow, all those kinds of things were integrated into this mimetic display. Now, in addition to that, we had this other way to sort out what's inside out and what's outside in because we wanted to see the whole world at one time, but at the same time, we had an instantaneous, instantaneous view of the world. So we wanted an exocentric and egocentric view of the world. And we did it this way by projecting basically a, this, this fish bowl in your lap, which had the whole world contained there. And then you look up and you see the inside out view, that piece of the world. And the way you'd interact with this is you just point at something and say, what is that? And the laser line would come out, a virtual laser line would come out of your finger and show that in the real world. Or you look in the real world and say, where is that? You see it in your God's eye display. We've never been able to do that before. So I was working on this stuff for 23 years. I was flying into fighter airplanes. I was testing this stuff myself. And uh, I knew what kind of environment uh, this had to operate in. And basically that was the birth the real birth of virtual reality when all that was going on. And most people didn't know about it. It was all classified. And uh, until the CBS Evening News came to my lab at Wright-Patterson, and I had to do a press release. The generals in Washington wanted me to do that. And uh, that was when things changed. I didn't do R&D anymore. I was in show business <laughs> because then everybody had to come to see this crazy helmet and uh, this stuff is going on. But interesting what happened, I started getting these phone calls. This mother called me and said, I saw this program on television with that helmet that you built. Is there anything you could do for my child? My child has cerebral palsy. As you can, can you do anything with that technology? And then another uh, a surgeon called me. said, I'm a thoracic surgeon. I'm inside my patient up to my elbows trying to do a graft on the aorta. Is there anything you can do to use that technology to help me sort of put my eyes inside the patient? Then another surgeon said, well, I want to do a minimally invasive surgical procedure. I want to sort of be on the inside looking out rather than outside looking in. Firefighting company called, said, we have this problem with firefighters. They're going into these burning buildings. They don't know where the fire is. They're filled with smoke. They don't know if there are any people there. They don't know where the other firefighters are. And the guy who's sort of directing things is the fire chief. He's outside the building. He has a radio. And he knows nothing. <laughs> so... Can we figure out a way to build a network or a way for these to communicate with each other spatially? Well, my answer to all these people, and I was getting three or four phone calls a week. I said, well, yeah, you could do that. As a matter of fact, that'd be sort of easy compared to what, what I'm trying to do. So that really put me on a different track. And I decided, you know, the best thing we can do with this technology, the taxpayers have spent a lot of money on this, is to get it out and to start working on things that are beyond the military applications, especially for medicine and education and, and design and those kind of things. And we knew it would work for those things. So I beat my sword into plowshare in 1989 and became an academic. This was gonna be an easy life. I was gonna kick back, think great thoughts, you know, teach a couple of courses, have some graduate students. It's gonna be real easy, right, Walt? It was gonna really be, um, well, it didn't turn out that way. I never worked so hard in my life. You know, you have about four or five jobs you have to do at one time. But what I did was started a lab called the Human Interface Technology Lab. And the idea was to take that technology I'd been working on all those years and somehow continue to develop and get it out. But this time with a lot of smart students. So one of the first things we did, one of my first patents after that, was this personal eyewear display. Uh, people didn't know what virtual images were. So I said, okay, let's sort of, uh, you know, the Walkman had come out from Sony. Let's come up with a Watchman. And so this idea, this was the first consumer virtual display. It was on the market. Built by Virtual Vision. We used my patent. The whole idea here is that you would have this display look like sort of skewed. Actually, it looks sort of like a HoloLens, doesn't it? Well, I beat the HoloLens to this, okay? So what you had was a one-meter screen, at about three meters away. That, uh, so it was a multiplex display. So you see the outside world without any problem, then you look in this particular area and you see this screen. And what you could do is you wear this battery pack here with a television receiver, and then you could um, 
actually uh, uh, go to Waikiki Beach and watch the NFL playoffs. Why you'd ever want to do that, I'm not sure, but you could do it, you know, with this. <laughs> Well, as it turns out, we, we raised the money for this, we started the company, Virtual Vision, and um, we had this big news release, went to Consumer Electronics Show, people lined up for two hours to see this thing, and they, everybody told us, gosh, you guys are going to make a fortune on this, this is amazing. And so we opened this, and we uh, started building these things, manufacturing them, released them, <clears throat> people show up, they try it on, and they say, wow, this is really cool. And, uh, and they said, how much does it cost? Well, it cost $799. They said, ooh, these are mainly guys. Ooh, I'd better talk to my wife about this before. <laughs> now, you can imagine how that conversation went. Yeah. Well, it was a disaster. Uh, nobody bought them except uh, this one segment. Venice started buying these things like crazy. Venice? Why were dentists about? So we went to one of these dentists. I said, what are you doing with this? And they said, well, what we're trying to do is sort of entertain the patients. You know, give them something to do while we're inflicting pain on them. And so um, the idea here is they go select a movie and they put on the headset, they plug in the, the VCR and uh, they would, uh, um, you know, watch a show. But the dentist said, it works great. They don't complain. I could get on with my work, but it is creating a new problem. We can't get them to leave now. I can't leave now. This is a good part, you know. But really more, more remarkable than that is what happened with the little kids. Here you see a little girl. What she have in her hands? Nintendo. So here she is in the dentist chair playing Nintendo. And now these little kids are telling their mothers, when can I go back to the dentist again so I could put on those... Now, when did you ever get kids that want to go back to the dentist? But that's what was happening. And we started looking at that and said, wow, this is pretty cool. Uh, what's going on here? And then we started doing some experiments at the Children's Hospital, Seattle Children's Hospital. And then these patients who had leukemia, uh, who had, you had to take uh, bone marrow samples, determine the efficacy of this chemotherapy. So these kids were bent over. The doctor puts in the needle, and, the, and, and they're playing Nintendo with this. The kid's going, uh. And the doctors and nurses are looking at it. Usually the kids scream because it's so painful. You can't anesthetize them because they're so sick. We're saying, wow, we need a television none to mind, but this is, uh, this is really going beyond that. So that's what got us into pain and what got us into burn pain. And then the original work was done in burn pain, uh, a non-opiate uh, analgesic for pain was done there at the lab with Hunter Hoffman, one of my colleagues that I hired. And, um, and then after that, we got into PTSD. And then to, and it sort of went from there. And phobias. Um, so, um, with this new uh, way of uh, working with pain, we realized that uh, we had to prove that this would really work. And that's when we got into brain scans and things like that to show that really we were shifting things from the pain centers. So all that original work we're doing really did lead to some of the foundational work for what we see as a series of uh, head-mounted displays that uh, some of which were better than others. But it was clear to me that we're never gonna get there doing it the way we're doing because we're starting off with a real image and that we're projecting it to make it look like a virtual image. So what we needed is a better way to do that. And so here you see on the left-hand side is the typical way where you take some kind of image plane, matrix element display, you magnify, collimate it, and project it. So you see the virtual image. This is how the Vive works and how the uh, uh, Oculus Go and all the, uh, even the, uh, the um, Samsung Gear work these days. That's just not going to get us there. Not even come close to the resolution field of view. So I said, what if we just use the eye as a projection screen, the retina of the eye? What if we talk, took a photon stream that was generated by many micro, very low energy lasers? We would modulate that laser light, we'd scan it, and basically directly on the retina of the eye. There is no image plane anywhere except on the retina. So what you see is this amazing image at optical infinity um, and at, uh, with high saturation, high luminance, high resolution. It can be any field of view you want it to be. And it's really based upon a pixel flow. How fast can you modulate those things? 
So this idea is the virtual retinal display, scanning an image directly on the retina of the eye. That patent was issued in, 2000, uh, in 1995. It expired, right? Along with the other stuff, we can modulate depth. We can modulate the depth of those pixels by the light wave front. We could also, in my patent was this scanning laser array, two-dimensional array where it was all electronically beam speared like a, like a phased array radar. Way too soon <laughs> to have a patent issued. Now, of course, Magic Leap is using that and a number of other companies are using light wave technology. Nevertheless, that was the idea. And here's an optical bench back in that day. Uh, where you, we have the scanning of the light directly on the retina. Well, what happened was one day, how am I doing for time? Oh, gosh. Um, one day, that is going down. Yeah, that's good. Uh, it goes down and then back up again. Uh, one day, this guy shows up in my lab. Uh, and he says, I've heard about this virtual retinal display. Can you, uh, I'd like to see it. We said, sure, come on down. We took him down to the basement of the lab and we were scanning uh, the image on his uh, retina and things like that. And, and he said, wow, this is really cool. And he said, yeah, take off your spectacles and uh, look at it. And he did and he said, wow, it's just as clear without my spectacles as it is with my, with my glasses. And then on his own, he happened to look at it with his other eye. This is a monocular system at the time. He said, wait a minute, what are you guys doing here? We said, what do you mean? He says, I can see this with my blind eye. We said, what? I'm blind in my left eye, and I can see that image. Oh, yeah? <laughs> so that sent us over to the Department of Ophthalmology, and they started sending patients to us. To, and what was happening is we were getting through a lot. It turns out this particular guy had been in an automobile accident that left, left a lot of scar tissue in his eye, but apparently the retina, part of the retina was still working. But we found it worked for a number of these patients, even the macular degeneration, because it turns out the receptors are like channels, waveguides. And we were getting, because we were using coherent light, we were getting much, more couple of, better, much better coupling efficiency into those receptors than, we were, you, than you get from the broadband light. So that led us into a grant from the National Science Foundation where we started working on low vision applications of this technology. And then, of course, we, since we can modulate the, life, uh, the light wave front, we could create this true 3D display. That means that when you have a pixel, now right now all the VR stuff that you have out there, everything's collimated to one distance. Even though you have binocular cues, everything from an accommodative standpoint is the same distance. So that's not real 3D. That's pretend 3D. In order to do real 3D, you have to put those pixels, those voxels, at a particular distance. So we could do that with this um, particular virtual retinal display technique. Okay, so over the years, there's this list of stuff that um, we've done. We did the, uh, we did the first uh, AR um, company. Uh, we did uh, some other things. We did the learning center. We built seven surgical simulators, but this is the most important one at all. Here at the bottom, <laughs> all right. But that same woman who says I'm handsome says you can't retire. And so, so I, it looks like they, I'm going to have to work until they take me out in the box. Okay, so Splendid Torch. I feel I'm at this point in time when I'm about ready to hand it to you guys. I've done the laps, you know, and you're going to now take that torch. But I'm going to let it burn as brightly as I can uh, because you're the ones that are really going to do good with it and carry on much beyond what, uh, what I've been able to do. And by the way, all of this wasn't about me. It was about all these wonderful people that I worked with over the years. Now, what I'd like to do in the few 30 seconds I have left uh, is a sort of introduce a manifesto for this group. Um, and, uh, and this manifesto is more guidelines <laughs> than anything else, but I like the term manifesto. So let me give you some. We are playing with fire. VR is like fire. You know, we have we split the atom. We're releasing so much energy because what we have is the key to spatial memory. And that key comes because we put a place in people because we can put people in a place. That is really powerful. And what it does in that unlocking is amazing retention. Also a visceral connection. If you blow somebody's brains out in VR, 
it's different than when you're doing it on the screen because you remember it and it'll be there forever. You never forget a virtual experience. So we are playing with this amazing tool that can be good or can be bad. And we have the responsibility to make sure good is done with it. Another thing we have to do is do no harm. We have to understand how the visual and vestibular interaction works because we're making people sick in VR. And it's not because of the technology. It's because we don't know what we're doing. People who are developing this content you have to understand that we cannot have this conflict between visual and vestibular cues or we're going to make people sick, along with other things there. So we can't do harm because that's a showstopper. That'll kill this whole thing faster than anything else. And the lawyers will be on the cases of everybody. Just wait. We've got to be really careful about that. We have to relish those sacred moments. How much of you have had experience where you put a person in a virtual world the first time? Yeah, yeah. Isn't it amazing? It's, it really is a sacred moment where you now are opening a whole new world to people that they've never seen before. And we have to understand, we who are doing that have a responsibility to savor that and to enjoy it because that's a special privilege that we have to be able to introduce that. Okay, they're telling me to quit now. So uh, can I get through the rest of my uh, 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 manifesto? What? Yes? One minute. I have to get through the rest of it. Uh, we need to treasure the children. Uh, I, it's really, in the end, it's about the kids and how we help them become all they can become. I'd love to talk more about that, but can't. This is, we've got to do this. We have to shun violence at all costs in VR. I got to tell you this story. I was giving a talk at VRX a couple of years ago, and a sort of fireside chat about about a thousand people there. And uh, after that, I gave my talk. This guy came running up to me and says, "You know, uh, we want to show you our new thing." And so I went back in the back room with him, and he put on this amazing—I'm not going to tell you the company—put on an amazing headset. Amazing. It was good. It was good, and the graphics were amazing. Things like that. But in this particular thing they were playing a game that had to do with a uh, getaway van, just robbed a bank, and now you're being chased by the police, and um, the police were driving by in motorcycles. You had a Uzi in your lap. You're putting clips in the Uzi, and you're shooting these policemen, blowing their brains out, and the police were shooting back at you, and the bullets were, I mean, it was amazing graphics and everything like that. And they, after I left, the, after I put, took the headset off, and I looked at these guys, and I said, Really? They said, what do you think? What do you think? I said, really? Come on. We have this amazing technology. You've done a great job on that. And he says, well, that, 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 that's what sells, though. I said, I don't believe it. The reason it sells is because you're making it. If you give the kids a chance to make a world, they don't put any of that stuff in there. They want to create. Just look at Minecraft, what they're doing. Don't do any harm. Go outdoors. We got to forest bathe just as much as we need to play in VR. We got to go spend all our, you know, 24 hours a day in VR. It's really we'll spend these little segments when it can make a difference for us. But then what we want to use VR to do is to appreciate more what's really out there, like the tree. How many of you have seen the tree? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's pretty cool. And, uh, but uh, after you've been in a virtual forest, it makes you appreciate a real forest more. Brace diversity. I think that's an obvious. Not only diversity in, from an ethnicity standpoint, but also from discipline standpoint. It requires all kinds of discipline to make this go. Need to navigate with our hearts. You know, we're in a high sea state right now. We used to have a good map. We used to have a good compass. We used to have a sextant. We could shoot the stars, know where we are in this space. We don't see the horizon anymore. It's, we're in the middle of a storm. It's chaotic. All the things are happening so fast. How are we going to navigate at this time? The only tool we have to navigate our hearts. Our hearts know what we should be doing and what's good and what's right. So we need to do that.
with that new navigation system. I was given a talk to the Washington Tree Fruit Growers Association um, about uh, 10 years ago. And uh, I was sent by the dean out there. That they wanted somebody to talk from the <laughs> university. So how, what do you say to Washington Tree Fruit Growers, you know, about VR? But I gave them this talk about VR and things like that. And after I finished, all these parents came up. And they said, wow, this is amazing. This is going to be the future of our children. What should I get them to do? What kind of courses should they take? Should they learn how to program and all this kind of thing? I said, no. What you get them to do is to read the classics. Because there are more virtual worlds out there in our libraries by reading than we're ever going to be able to make. Plus the fact we have to keep imagination going. We need to build these worlds that lift and edify. I also want to, to encourage you, if you haven't already, to watch the last lecture. Randy Pausch. Randy Pausch gave the last lecture. It wasn't about computer science. It was about life. And achieving your childhood dreams. And join kindred spirits. And this is where, uh, this is a kindred spirit group. And I was hoping to make this virtual world society the same. I don't have any more time to, to talk about that. Uh, I did want to talk about what I saw as the future, but uh, as usual, I wax poetic and I never get done. <laughs> but if you do want to have copies of my slides, I'll be happy to send them to you, which have those last bits in there. But there's, humans are remarkable. We are remarkable. And the capability we have can be enhanced with VR. I think we can extend our vision, our audition, our touch. We can train our senses better with this VR. And one other thing, last thing, is that we have to understand that thoughts are things. Our thoughts have great power. In the words of Henry Van Dyke, I hold it true that thoughts are things endowed with bodies and breath and wings, and that we send them forth to fill the earth with good or will or ill. That which we call our secret thought speeds forth the earth's remote, remotest spots, leaving blessings as it goes or its woes. I'm not saying this correctly, but uh, thoughts are another word for fate. Choose then this destiny and wait, for love brings love and hate brings hate. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.